In the structured atomic model, there is no strong nuclear force to hold the proton inside the nucleus, and there are no neutrons. Instead of neutrons, we have protons and what are termed inner electrons. These inner electrons are the glue that holds the protons in place, binding them together into a nucleus. Let's run through the principles that govern this in SAM. So what are the rules that govern the placement of these inner electrons? The natural position would be between two protons holding them together with the electrostatic force. This inner electron needs at least two anchor points to be stable. Generally, this will be between two protons. Where there are multiple inner electrons, they will attempt to place themselves as far away from other inner electrons as possible. There is also another case to consider, that of the neutron. In SAM, there are no actual neutrons, instead these are protons joined with an electron, or a so-called proton-electron pair. As there is no second anchor point when removed from the nucleus, this makes them unstable, and we find in nature that the neutrons naturally decay into protons and electrons after about 15 minutes. When we examine atoms in the periodic table, we see that as we move along the table, each element has different properties that seem to be governed by the number of protons. But as we have previously discussed, these protons don't always go up in steps of one, from one element to the next. In the structured atomic model, an element is defined by the number of proton-electron-proton constructs, in other words, deuterons, which is a conglomerate of a proton and a proton-electron pair. In the following image, we will denote the inner electron as a yellow sphere, these will occupy the space between the protons. The actual shape and whether or not the inner electron has a physical structure is not relevant at this stage. If we examine helium, we see two deuterons connected. Lithium-6 would be the next stable element in SAM, and we see three deuterons connected here. But this geometry leaves what is called a neutron gap. We find there are heavier isotopes of lithium, Lithium-7 is the most common form of lithium, and we can see it has an additional neutron or proton-electron pair on top of the three deuterons. The additional inner electron this provides is not able to create a new deuteron, therefore the properties remain as those of lithium. If we add two additional neutrons or proton-electron pairs, we arrive at lithium-9. We now have three proton-electron pairs so three additional inner electrons, but again these have not formed a deuteron, so this still remains as lithium. This is however an unstable nucleus, and through the ejection of one of the inner electrons in one of these proton-electron pairs via beta decay, the nucleus can rearrange the internal electrons and form an additional deuteron, creating the element beryllium, which contains four deuterons. This still has an additional neutron or proton-electron pair, as a structure with eight spheres is not stable as we discussed in the previous video. We therefore end up going from lithium-7 to beryllium-9. Adding another neutron or proton-electron pair, we create beryllium-10. This quickly decays to boron-10 through the ejection of an inner electron, again via beta decay. This creates yet another deuteron in the nucleus, and therefore means it changes its property from beryllium to boron. Adding two more proton-electron pairs creates boron-12, which decays through the emission of an electron from one of the proton-electron pairs into carbon-12. In the previous episode, we looked at the positioning of the protons up to carbon-12 using the densest spherical packing method. The first elements mimic this build-up through the densest packing principle exactly. The important point to realise is that the number of deuterons plus the number of single protons not bound in deuterons determines the element. The proton-electron pairs in the nucleus which do not form deuteron pairs instead are responsible for creating the isotopes of that particular element. The addition of additional neutrons or proton-electron pairs therefore creates all of the isotopes of an element. The inner electron will also have a sphere of influence which stretches beyond a single proton to the range of several protons. Current science will tell you that an electron is a point particle with a point charge and no spatial extent. 
If, however, we consider what is called the classical electron radius, which is essentially a combination of fundamental physical quantities that define the length scale for problems involving an electron interacting with electromagnetic radiation, then we find that the electron seems to have a physical size that is considerably larger than a proton. These inner electrons are considered to be in a fixed position, otherwise they would initiate a nuclear reaction. The size of the electrons as well as their position creates a sphere that glues the protons in the solid shapes we looked at in the last episode. More inner electrons will mean a stronger inward force. If we take the example of carbon-12, then this creates an icosahedron structure. The electrons can be seen as the larger yellow spheres due to their increased range of influence. This creates spots around the structure that will have a more positive charge compared to others. Could these areas play any role for the positioning of the outer electrons? If we jump back to the deuteron, we can see that it has two positive spots at the outer ends of the protons, while the inner electron sits in the middle. With deuterium, there is only one outer electron. The outer electron will be repelled by the inner electron. Outer electrons follow the same rules as inner electrons and require two anchor points, and would have to choose between one of the two poles. It would take a position that is as far as possible away from the inner electrons, and also as close as possible to the positive nucleus hotspots. If we compare this to hydrogen 1, then it can easily be seen that there are no distinctive positive spots, meaning that the outer electron could be anywhere around the proton. One question you may ask is why does the electron not simply join with a proton to form a proton-electron pair? But as we have seen, there aren't two binding points, as there is only one proton, meaning it would not be stable. As the nucleus structure gets larger, these positive spots on the surface will determine the location of the outer electrons. The larger the structure, the more likely the outer electrons are more restricted in their movement. If we take carbon as an example, the outer electrons will arrange themselves around the icosahedron shape with equal spacing. So in simple terms, the outer electrons arrange themselves in relation to the positive spots on the nucleus while distancing themselves from one another due to their repulsion from each other. The system balances out the forces. An outer electron with more energy, i.e. in an excited state, will be further from the nucleus, since the nucleus will continue to attract the outer electrons towards their original position due to the dentist packing rules, it will fall back to its ground state and emit the energy it had absorbed. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.